أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أقول لكم عندي خزائن الله ولا أعلم الغيب ولا أقول لكم إني ملك إن أتبع إلا ما يوحى إلي قل هل يستوي الأعمى والبصير أفلا تتفكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد my respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we've reached ayah number 50 of Surah Al An'am. And the translation of ayah number 50 reads as follows Say, I do not say to you, I have with me the treasures of Allah, nor do I know the unseen, nor do I say that I am an angel. I only follow what is revealed to me. Say, are the blind and the seeing equal? Well, why then do you not reflect? In this ayah you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the argument that the mushrikeen, that the disbelievers have cited as the basis for their rejection of the message of Islam. You find that there are three arguments that have been put forward in this ayah. This is essentially the response to three arguments that were put forward by the disbelievers as to why they rejected the prophethood of Rasulullah. The first is, and I'll list them and then I'll I'll uh, I'll give my commentary, inshaAllah. So the first reason that is cited is the Holy Prophet, at least in their eyes, his failure to produce worldly goods. This is number one. Number two, his inability to foretell the precise time of the Day of Judgment. And number three, the Prophet having a human nature as opposed to being of an angelic nature. Now, when you look at the Holy Qur'an, there are many verses that allude to the first argument that was cited. Because the ayah begins where, where the Prophet is instructed to tell the disbelievers, قُلْ لَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ عِنْدِي خَزَائِنُ اللَّهِ Say to them, O Muhammad, that I do not say to you that I have with me the treasures of Allah. You see the mushrikeen, the kuffar, they would often ask the Holy Prophet to produce a fortune, to show them worldly fortune as evidence that he has connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, if you turn to Surah Al-Isra, Surah number 17, verses 90 and 91. In these two verses, the, the disbelievers, they say to the Prophet, وَقَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِن لَكْ O Muhammad, we will never believe you until حَتَّى تَفْجُرَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَنْبُوعًا We will never believe you. We will never believe that you are a messenger of God until you make springs gush from the earth. أَن تَكُونَ لَكَ جَنَّةٌ مِنْ نَخِيلٍ وَعِنَبٍ or until you're able to, or until you are granted a lush garden of palm trees, of dates and grapes, فَتُفَجِّرَ الْأَنْهَارَ خِلَالَهَا تَفْجِيرًا And we want you 
to make springs gush in the midst of this garden. So here you find that the, the disbelievers are asking the Holy Prophet to essentially show them that he is a man of wealth because owning land, owning orchards was a sign of wealth. And here they see Rasulullah he's an orphan. He's not necessarily wealthy. He has a band of followers that have a low economic status. So their first reason why they reject the Holy Prophet is that he doesn't really have anything to show for, at least from a materialistic standpoint. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Holy Prophet, tell them that I do not possess, I do not have with me the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, He gives to whomever He chooses. And then the ayah says, وَلَا أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبِ Time and time again, the disbelievers would mockingly ask, when is the day of judgment? Rasulullah would speak about the final hour, the day of resurrection. The mushrikeen, the kuffar, they would ask the Prophet to give them the exact time. When he would speak about the day of Qiyamah, they would say that if you're a prophet of God, tell us when this day will come. Give us an exact time. If you go, for example, to Surah Al-A'raf, Surah number 7, Ayah number 187, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَا يَسْأَلُونَك يَسْأَلُونَك For those of you who are familiar with Arabic, يَسْأَلُونَك is فِعْلْ مُضَارِعَ It's a present tense verb, which indicates that this was a question that, they, that, this was a question that would, they would regularly pose to the Holy Prophet. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ They ask you, O Muhammad, about the hour, meaning the day of judgment. What do they ask you? Are they asking you what they should do to prepare for it? No. أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَا When is this day going to happen? When will this day come? Give us a precise time when this day will arrive. قُلْ And then Allah in this ayah he says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ رَبِّي Surely the knowledge of the coming of the Day of Judgment, the timing of the Day of Judgment, is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some commentators of the Qur'an, they say that when Rasulullah says, I do not know the ghayb, I don't know the unseen, it's referring to this specific aspect of the unseen, which is the timing of the Day of Judgment. Other commentators of the Qur'an, they say no, the Holy Prophet is actually declaring that he does not have knowledge of the unseen. But we know that there are many ahadith that we find in hadith literature where the Holy Prophet on many occasions spoke about events that will happen in the future with 100% accuracy. Many of you may know that when Rasulullah delivered his famous Ramadan sermon, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, and this is re reported in both Shia collections of hadith and Sunni collections of hadith, that after he gave this khutbah, Amir al muminin asked the Holy Prophet, and many of you have heard this, he asks Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, ma afdalu la'mal fi hadha shahr? What is the best thing to do in this holy month, the month of Ramadan, the Prophet responds and he says, Afdalu al-a'mal al an maharim Allah. The best action that you can do in this month is to abstain from sin. And then the hadith says that the Holy Prophet broke down into tears. And then Ali ibn Abi Talib asks Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, wa ma yubki? Why are you crying? Rasulullah tells Amir al muminin that I am crying because of what will happen to you during this month. It's as though I see you offering units of prayer in your mihrab and I see the blood from your head drenching your beard. 
Now this is an example. This is one example of the Holy Prophet disclosing knowledge of future events. And this is a type of ilmul ghaib. So how do we reconcile the multiplicity of traditions that indicate that Rasulullah did indeed have knowledge of the unseen and this ayah of the Quran where Allah is telling the Prophet to tell these disbelievers I don't have knowledge of the unseen. Muslim philosophers and Muslim theologians alike, they make a distinction between what they called ilmun bil ghayb bil arav and ilmun bil ghayb bil that. They make a distinction between knowledge of the unseen that is acquired and inherent knowledge of the unseen. In this ayah, what type of ilmul ghayb is the Prophet negating? Acquired knowledge of the unseen or inherent knowledge of the unseen? Rasulullah in this ayah, he's saying that I don't know, I don't have knowledge of the unseen. Meaning, for me to have knowledge of the unseen, Allah has to disclose this knowledge to me. Whereas when we say that Allah is alimul ghayb, when we say Allah has knowledge of the unseen, that is inherent. Allah didn't acquire that knowledge from another entity. So from, from a theological standpoint, we believe that Rasulullah has acquired knowledge of the unseen, not inherent knowledge of the unseen, because inherent knowledge of the unseen is a quality that is only attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find evidence for this even in the Holy Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some instances he does disclose knowledge of the unseen to special personalities. If you go to Surah Al-Jinn, Surah 72 of the Holy Quran, and this is an important ayah for us to even memorize. Verse number 26 and 27. In ayah number 26, Allah says, Alimul Ghayb, the knower of the unseen, meaning Allah. Fala yudhhiru ala ghaybihi ahada. Allah does not disclose knowledge of the unseen to anyone. This is the general rule. But to every rule, there is an exception. And here Allah mentions the exception. In the next ayah, illa. So the general rule is Allah doesn't give knowledge of the unseen to anyone except illa man irtadha min rasul except a messenger whom he is pleased with. So here we have a category of individuals who are worthy of being recipients of this knowledge of the unseen. So here this is an example of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealing to us that he on some occasions does disclose knowledge of the unseen. But this knowledge of the unseen that's given to prophets is what? Acquired ilmul ghayb, acquired knowledge of the unseen. So the first argument that has been put forward by the disbelievers as to why they reject the Holy Prophet is number one, his inability to produce worldly goods and worldly fortune. Number two, and we mentioned the ayah from Surah Al-Isra, where they're asking the Holy Prophet, they essentially, where is all your wealth? Where are your treasures? Where is your fortune? Number two, that he doesn't know the unseen, specifically the Day of Judgment. And then number three, the Prophet's human nature Many on many occasions, there are many verses in the Quran where the the disbelievers they 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 uh, protest. They say, "O oh Muhammad, if you are divinely appointed, if you are a messenger of God, why are you not an angel? Why are you a human being? Or why are you not at least accompanied with an angel that we can see?" If you go to Surah Al Furqan, which is Surah number twenty-five of the Holy Quran, Ayah number seven. Again, this is a protest. 
that is put forward by the disbelievers. وَقَالُوا مَا لِهَذَا الرَّسُولِ يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامُ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ What kind of messenger is this? Who eats food and walks in the marketplace? Meaning they're essentially arguing that this is a human being. What makes him better than us? Why has he been chosen? What gives him distinction? Lola unzila ilayhi malak. Why was not an angel sent? Fayakunu ma'ahu nadir. So that this angel can accompany the Holy Prophet and also assist him in being a warner. So, as a review, this ayah essentially refutes the three arguments that are put forward by the Mushrikeen. Their first argument was as to why they reject the Prophet of, of Rasulullah. They cite the Prophet's failure to produce miraculous worldly goods. Number two, his inability to foretell the precise coming of the Day of Judgment. And number three, that the Prophet is of human nature and not of angelic nature. And then the ayah ends with another instruction to the Holy Prophet to tell them, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الْأَعْمَى Oh, in attabi'u illa ma yuha ilayh. Before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, Tell them, O Muhammad, that everything that I do is inspired by revelation. Meaning, the reason why I don't display worldly fortune to you, this miraculous worldly fortune that you're asking me to show, and the reason why I don't disclose to you the day of judgment, and the reason why Allah didn't send an angel alongside me, it's because I'm an abd, I'm Allah's servant. Everything that I do is divinely inspired. It's not up to me, Rasulullah is essentially arguing. But here you find, where many of us are familiar with the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah An-Najm, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ that the Holy Prophet does not speak of his own accord. Rather, what he speaks is divine inspiration. It's wahi. Here, when, when the Holy Prophet says, in attabi'u illa ma yuha ilay, here the Holy Prophet is saying that not only are my words wahi, but everything that I do is a form of revelation. So in Surah An-Najm, what was highlighted is what? That the Holy Prophet's words are divinely inspired. In ayah number 50, here, when the Holy Prophet says, In attabi'u illa ma yuha ilay, I follow what has been revealed to me. It's an indication that not only are the Prophet's words divinely inspired, but even his actions. His actions are a form of revelation. And then the ayah ends with, Say, are the blind and the seeing equal? Why, why do they not reflect? Now here, of course, uh, blindness and the ability to see is not referring to our physical eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is speaking about spiritual sight and spiritual blindness. There's a beautiful hadith from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, where he says, لَيْسَ الْأَعْمَى مَنْ يَعْمَى بَصَرُ The Holy Prophet, he says, the one who is blind is not the one who has lost his eyesight. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَى مَنْ تَعْمَى بَصِيرَةُ The Holy Prophet says, rather, the one who is truly blind is the one who has lost his insight. Not the one who has lost his eyesight. The one who has lost his insight. And this is the underlying message of هَلْ يَسْتَوَ الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرَ أَفَلَا تَتَفَكَّرُونَ If we go to the next ayah, ayah number 51, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنذِرْ بِهِ الَّذِينَ يَخَافُونَ أَنْ يُحْشَرُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ لَيْسَ لَهُمْ مِن دُونِهِ وَلِيٌّ وَلَا شَفِيعٌ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ O Muhammad, and warn by the Qur'an those who fear 
that they will be gathered before their Lord. For them besides him will be no protector and no intercessor that they might ward off evil. Now who is this I referring to? Who is meant by those who fear that they will be gathered before their Lord? There's a difference of opinion among the Mufassireen. Some of the commentators, they say, those who fear that they will be gathered before their Lord on the Day of Judgment is a reference to the Muslims who believe in resurrection theoretically and they fear God's judgment on that day but they are deficient in their a'mal they are deficient in their works and this is the case with many Muslims today theoretically they do hold a belief in the day of, uh, on, on the day of judgment but they need to be warned they need to be reminded that it's not enough for you to only harbor a belief in the hereafter but rather you have to exhibit certain qualities you have to have certain actions that indicate that you are truly preparing for that fearful day other commentators say that this ayah refers to ahlul kitab because the people of the book the jews and the christians they believe in the hereafter they believe in the messengers and the prophets and the scriptures but they have not accepted the prophethood of Rasulullah. So warn them with the Quran, warn them by the Quran that they should not stop with Isa, they should not stop with Musa and the Torah or Isa and the Injil. They have to complete their faith. If the Torah is the Old Testament, and the Bible is the New Testament, the Quran is the final testament. So you cannot reject Allah's final testament to humanity. You cannot oppose his final messenger. Because opposing the final messenger is tantamount to rejecting all of the prophets and the messengers. And there are other commentators of the Quran, they say those who fear that they will be gathered before their Lord. This is a reference to the mushrikeen. Now, although the mushrikeen, they ascribe partners with Allah, there were at least a few of them who harbored a hidden fear of the Day of Judgment. And they understood that there is a reality known as Akhirah. And because they had this deep-rooted belief, they could potentially be amenable to the Holy Prophet's warning. Now, Allah says, وَأَنذِرْ بِهِ الَّذِينَ يَخَافُونَ أَنْ يُحْشَرُ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ لَيْسَ لَهُمْ مِن دُونِهِ وَلِيٌّ وَلَا شَفِيعٌ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ If these individuals do not prepare for the Day of Judgment adequately, and if they don't, if we're speaking about the Jews and the Christians, and they do not embrace the Holy Prophet and acknowledge that the Quran is the world of Allah, they will not have any wali, they will not have any protector on the Day of Judgment, and they will not have any shafi'ah. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ A shafi'ah that will give them taqwa, give them that protection. Because taqwa comes, comes from the word wiqaya which means to safeguard yourself from harm. The only thing that will safeguard you from harm, that will protect you from harm, is if Allah is your protector. And if Allah, and, and if Allah is your shafi'a. You have no other protector or intercessor other than Allah on that, on that day. Now, the question that naturally arises, especially for those who come from a Shia, Ithna Ashari theological school, we're taught that Prophets and Imams will intercede for us on the Day of Judgment. But in this ayah, it seems that protection and intercession is limited and it's, it's exclusively in Allah's hands. Now again, the same argument is put forward. Just as we said, 
Ilmul Ghaib is bil arad or bil that. Similarly, intercession is the same. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can intercede or grant intercession. Every other intercession other than divine intercession is acquired. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's inherent. The only protection that is available is divine protection. Unless this type of wilaya is conferred upon certain personalities. And Allah has granted this wilaya, this guardianship, this protection to certain personalities. As we read in Surah Al-Ma'idah, for example, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاءُ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Allah tells us that I am your, I'm not your only wali. Rasulullah has wilayah over you because I have given him wilayah. And by submitting to him, you also get this protection. Because guardianship and protection go hand in hand. When you embrace the guardianship of Allah, his messenger, and Amir al muminin and the Ahlul Bayt, you receive a type of protection on that day. And you also receive a type of shafa'ah on that day. There's a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, where he says there are three main groups that will intercede on the day of judgment on behalf of mu'mineen. They will intercede for believers. Rasulullah says, Thalathatun yashfa'una ila Allah fayushaffa'un. There are three groups who will intercede on the day of judgment and their intercession will be unequivocally accepted. Al-Anbiya, the intercession of prophets, the shafa'ah of prophets. Thumma al-ulama, and here the prophet is giving the order. So you have first tier, second tier, and third tier. The first tier is what? Al-Anbiya, prophets. Thumma al-ulama, then after the prophets, ulama. Imagine the rank of scholars. That if you look at the rank of intercessors on the day of Qiyamah, prophets occupy the highest position, and one degree beneath them is who? Ulama. Thumma shuhada. And finally, the third tier is what? The martyrs, those who gave their lives in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So not only will these individuals be granted admission into paradise, they will also have the ability to bring many others with them to paradise. And this is an aspect of Allah's mercy on the one hand, and this is also Allah's way of honoring these individuals. He honors them, and at the same time, He makes them doors to His mercy. There's another hadith from the sixth Imam, Al Imam Ja'far al Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi, where he mentions five intercessors he says there are five intercessors when rasulullah was mentioning the three it was probably mentioning the three main ones but here the imam alayhi salam is is perhaps adding a few other intercessors he says the intercessors are five al quran the quran itself will be a shafi' for the human being. As Imam Zainul Abidin salawatullahi alayhi says on the day of judgment, it will be said to the believer, iqra warqa, recite and ascend. Because the hadith from Imam al-Sajjad says the degrees and the levels in paradise are equivalent to the number of verses of the Qur'an. So however many verses have been memorized and implemented and understood, every verse will elevate you a degree. So you find that the Qur'an will be a source of intercession for us. Not only will it take individuals out of the al-fire, but it will allow them to ascend to the highest ranks in paradise. So number one is al-Qur'an, according to Imam Ja'far al-Sadr. Number two is war-rahim. Your relatives, if you have 
achieved a high spiritual station, you will be able to do shafa'a for family members, for relatives. There are many ahadith that say that the student and the teacher of the Qur'an, the person who studies the Qur'an, will be able to do shafa'a for 10 relatives and family members who have been damned to the hellfire. Meaning if it was only their a'mal, they would end up in the hellfire. But because of this relative who has achieved this type of relationship with the Qur'an, this relative will be able to intercede with them on the Day of Judgment. Other scholars, they say, what is meant by ar-rahim is that maintaining ties with your family members will be a type of intercession for you on the Day of Judgment. If you stay in touch and you don't sever ties with family members, you reach out to family members or relatives that have cut you off, this gesture will be a shafi' for you on the Day of Judgment. Wal-amana, granting immunity to individuals who you have the power to punish, for example. Wal-amana. Or this could also be a reference to being a trustworthy person, respecting the amana that people have given you. This will also be a, a type of shafi'ah for you. Then the Holy Prophet says, وَنَبِيُّكُمْ Your Prophet will be a shafi'ah for you. وَأَهْلُ بَيْتِ نَبِيُّكُمْ And his Ahlul Bayt will also be shufa'a for you on that day. Ayah number 52. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, again, addressing the Holy Prophet, وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ مَا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ وَمَا مِنْ حِسَابِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَتَطْرُدَهُمْ فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ the translation reads, and do not send away those who call upon their Lord in the morning and in the evening, seeking His face. Neither are you answerable for them, nor will they be held responsible for you. Do not disregard them, lest you become among the unjust. In order for us to understand this verse, we have to put it in its proper context. We have to understand the occasion of the revelation. This ayah of the Holy Quran, according to many commentators, they say this verse was reportedly revealed when a group of prominent Meccans indicated that they were willing to join Rasulullah's halaqa, his teaching circle. But they had one problem. They, they told the Holy Prophet that we're interested in joining your gathering. We want to sit in your majlis. But the problem was that they were loath to sit among and be associated with some of the Prophet's followers who were of a low social standing. Because as you know, brothers and sisters, many of the early Muslims, many of them were slaves or they were freed slaves or they were individuals who were destitute they were not very prominent they weren't very wealthy many of the early muslims were poor so the aristocrats of mecca the prominent meccans they basically indicated that ya rasulullah will join will sit in your teaching circle will perhaps even pray side by side with you if you remove and you drive away these fuqara. In fact, some of the companions of the Holy Prophet, some of the Mufassirin even said that Umar ibn al-Khattab suggested to the Prophet that let us drive away the poor Muslims, let us at least temporarily ask them to depart and to leave the gathering so we can host some of these wealthy Meccans. 
Some of the companions even asked the Prophet that is it possible if we ask the the poorer companions to pray in the back, meaning let's reserve the front row for the more affluent Muslims, the more affluent individuals. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here strongly condemns this suggestion. Allah tells the Prophet, do not listen to this advice that is being given to you. Do not listen to this suggestion that some of your companions are whispering to you. Because many of the companions, you know, perhaps they wanted to strengthen Islam by making it attractive to these wealthy disbelievers. That let us give the fuqara, the poor Muslims, a second class position. Let us give more importance and more attention to these wealthy individuals. And let us at least just temporarily ask the poor to leave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially admonishes these individuals. And he addresses the Holy Prophet saying, وَلَا تَطْرُدُ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ Ya Rasulullah, do not ever send away those who call upon their Lord day and night. Calling upon their Lord day and night could be a reference to the five daily prayers. Because if you look at the times of the prayers, there are some prayers that we offer when the sun is out. Dhuhr and Asr. It's daytime. Maghrib and Isha and Fajr are offered at when? At nighttime. So, يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ could be a reference to the fact that these are not just Muslims by name, they are practicing. They worship me day and night. يُرِيدُونَ wajha, And they're doing this. They're worshiping me to seek my face. Seek my face. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a physical face. You know, contrary to what you'll find in Sahih al-Bukhari, for example, there are some traditions in Bukhari that anthropomorphize God, that attribute human physical qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a hadith that says Rasulullah was once sitting with his ashab and it was nighttime and it was a full moon. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he looked up at the moon and he tells his companions, allegedly of course, he tells them, look, look at this moon. سَوْفَ تَرَوْنَ رَبَّكُمْ كَمَا تَرَوْنَ هَذَا الْقَمَرِ That you will see your Lord on the Day of Judgment in the same way that you see this moon. You will see the face of God. But here, according to our understanding, seeking His face metaphorically means to do something with sincerity, sincerity of intention. There are individuals, for example, if you read in Surah, in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِينَ وَلَا يَحُضُّ عَلَىٰ طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Allah, in some verses, He condemns those who offer prayers. Why? الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Those who neglect their prayers. There are those who pray seeking the praise of others. But Allah says, these poor followers that you have, not only do they worship me day and night, but they do it with ikhlas. They're seeking my pleasure. So this is one view. Some commentators of the Quran, they explain that this ayah, is a response to an accusation made by some of the Quraysh. You see, these Meccans, a lot of them were troublemakers. Many of them would tell the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, look at your followers. The majority of them are poor. They're not following you because they sincerely believe that you're the Messenger of Allah or they, they have submitted to the Lord of the Worlds. They're not doing it out of religious sincerity. 
but only because they hope to be fed and clothed by you. So get rid of them. Get rid of them. So they're essentially telling the Prophet that you have fake followers. Fake followers. There's no sincerity. They're poor and they're just joining you in hopes that you're going to feed them and give them, you know, put a roof over their heads, give them clothes. So according to this interpretation, the verse means to indicate that the Prophet has no responsibility to assess the possible ulterior motives behind his followers' apparent piety. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ وَمَا مِنْ حِسَابِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَتَطْرُدَهُمْ Ya Rasulullah, you're not responsible for you know, prying into people's private lives or assessing if they're doing things sincerely for me or not. You judge according to the vahir, to the apparent. And this is also a lesson for us, brothers and sisters. If Allah is telling the Prophet that you're not responsible to know what's in people's hearts, that take what you see at face value, meaning that if, they're, if they do good, assume that they're good. Judge according to the vahir. You're not responsible for knowing the batin. You're not responsible for knowing people's hidden agendas. Many of us, when we see a pious person, we want to conduct an investigation into their private lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this eye is essentially telling the Prophet that it's not your responsibility to investigate possible ulterior motives when you see apparent piety. When you see apparent piety, assume that they're pious. Now others suggest, and this is probably a more plausible opinion, that when Allah says you're not responsible for them and they're not responsible for you, this refers to the reckoning of the prominent Meccans who made the request to the Holy Prophet to drive away his poor companions. So this ayah indicates that the Prophet should not be too concerned with their embracing Islam, especially considering that they're stipulating that the Prophet is to drive away the poor Muslims. Ayah number 53. لِيَقُولُوا أَهَاؤُلَاءِ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ بَيْنِنَا أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَعْلَمَ بِالشَّاكِرِينَ Allah says, and thus we have tried some of them through others that they might say, is it these whom Allah has favored among us? Is it not Allah who is most knowing of those who are grateful? Now this is a very interesting verse because there are two ways to read this ayah. The idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries some people by means of others is a common theme in the Holy Quran. The general idea that the discrepancies in wealth and power among human beings serve as a trial for both groups. You see, brothers and sisters, the strong are tested with regard to their responsibility toward the needy. And the needy are also tested with, with regard to their trust and their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their humble acceptance of others' charity. It's also a test because in an Islamic society, when you're poor, you're also deserving of what? a certain stipend from Baytul Man, you may be deserving of zakat or of khums. It takes a certain degree of humility to, and, and humbleness to be a recipient of charity. This is also a test. The wealthy are, also, the wealthy are being tested and the poor are being tested. The strong are being tested and the weak are being tested. And they're a test for each other. In this context, it refers, and this is very interesting, brothers and sisters, I want you to pay attention to this. In this context, it refers specifically to the way in which the humble 
social status of the Prophet's early followers constituted a test for the prominent Meccans who had to overcome the false association of spiritual worth and social standing. Because in the eyes of the prominent Meccans, your spiritual worth is equal to your social standing. So, and this association is, is indicated by their contemptuous question where they say that, Is it these, these poor, destitute people whom Allah has favored, that they are the recipients of divine grace, that we have to join them? So for them, this was a test to kind of swallow their pride and break this false association of, of spiritual worth and social standing. It was also a test of their attachment to their own social standing and their own economic status. Since many of the followers of the Holy Prophet were poor and impoverished, if a prominent wealthy Meccan were to become Muslim, they would have to accept being instructed to some extent by the Prophet's poor followers. So for example, if, if I'm a wealthy Meccan and I become Muslim, most likely who's going to have to teach me the ABCs of Islam? Rasulullah is not going to be able to sit with me day and, day, day and night. Someone like Bilal al-Habashi has to come to me, the Arab, and he has to teach me how to pray. He has to teach me to do wudu. He has to teach me the ABCs of Tawheed and Qiyamah. So this was also a test for the prominent Meccans. At the same time, this was also a test. So you see how Allah is testing the prominent Meccans with the poor Muslims and how the poor Muslims are being tested with the wealthy Meccans. At the same time, this was also a test for the needier followers of the Holy Prophet who watched the disbeliever, the disbelieving Meccans continue to prosper while they themselves remained impoverished and vulnerable to persecution at the hands of the powerful disbelievers who disparaged their faith. And they would probably wonder, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to grant them worldly prosperity when they vehemently oppose his messenger? Why is Abu Sufyan enjoying his life? Why is he comfortable? Why is he enjoying comfort and ease? And he's waging a war against Rasulullah. While we, we worship Allah, we praise him, we glorify him, we don't associate partners with him. We're supporting his messengers and we're suffering. So this could have been a question that the believers were asking. Is it these, the likes of Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl, whom Allah has favored among us? So this question could be a question that the mushrikeen are asking, or it could be a, a question that the believers are asking. Now, it's interesting, you know, when you read the Qur'an, every generation, almost every prophet that was sent, the community of disbelievers, many of them would reject the prophets because the prophets always attracted the poor. If you look at the story of Nuh, the community of Nuh, at least the elite in his community, they say that why would we follow a man who only attracts the lowest class people, the poorest. You see that many of these disbelievers, they had a type of contempt for the needy, for the poor. And it's interesting, there was a hadith that I was reading today, that, and I'll share it with you, a very brief hadith, very short hadith, where the Holy Prophet, we know that the Holy Prophet went on Mi'raj. He ascended and he was able to see Paradise. Rasulullah, he says, He says, I saw paradise. 
and I was able to see who will inhabit paradise. The Holy Prophet says that when I looked into paradise, I was I was seeing that the majority of the inhabitants of paradise are who? Are the poor, the destitute, the needy, those who are deprived. Because brothers and sisters, when a person is deprived, of the most basic necessities believe me Allah will even probably overlook even their perverted belief system their adulterated belief system because how can you sincerely search for the truth and explore the deep questions about your existence when you don't even have food to put on the table when you have to worry about where you're gonna sleep where your next meal is gonna come from so Many of the fuqara around the world, Allah will compensate them because they were mazloom, because their share was usurped by those who lived affluent lives. So when you deprive people of basic necessities, you really can't blame them for going astray, at least to a, to a certain extent. And then in the next ayah, ayah number 53, وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا So in the previous verses, Allah is telling the Prophet, don't ever accept the suggestion to drive away your poor followers. Rather do what? وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا And when those come to you who believe in our signs, فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ don't drive them away, rather say salam to them. You initiate salam to them. You embrace them. Say peace be upon you. Kataba Rabbukum ala Rahman. Your Lord has decreed upon himself mercy. One aspect of Allah's mercy is mentioned here. Your Lord has decreed, He has prescribed mercy upon Himself. That any of you who does wrong out of ignorance and then repents and corrects Himself, Indeed, Allah is oft forgiving, exceedingly merciful. So here the Prophet is told that when these believers come to you, whether they are rich or they are poor, greet them, be very compassionate with them, say salam to them. And in fact, salam is not only the, only the way that believers greet each other in dunya, it's the, it's the way that they greet each other. It's the formal greeting amongst the inhabitants of paradise. Allah says in Surah Ibrahim, verse 27, تَحِيَّتُهُمْ fiha salam. Their official greeting, Allah is speaking about Ahlul Jannah, their official greeting amongst themselves is peace, peace be upon you. Rather than driving them away, Ya Rasulullah, greet them. Some narrators of the Qur'an, they say a group of believers came to the Holy Prophet and they confessed to the, to the Holy Prophet many terrible sins. You know, in the same way that Catholics, they go to the, the priest and they have confession. Many, a group of companions, they came to Rasulullah and they started to confess their sins to the Prophet. And they actually confessed some heinous crimes they had committed, some cardinal sins that they have committed the holy prophet didn't respond he didn't really know what to say here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals number one the first lesson is what just because someone commits a major sin even a major sin that doesn't take them out of the fold of islam don't ever call someone a kafir because they committed a sin. Allah says, when the believers come to you, Allah still calls them believers. 
even though they've committed sin. فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ Don't shun them. Of course, you do your amr bil-ma'ruf and nay'an al-munkar, but you should always make them feel like they can come to you, Ya Rasulullah. In the same way as parents, when your kids do something wrong, you don't want to scare them so much that they don't come to you anymore. You have to leave that door of mercy open. فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ that, Ya Rasulullah, when people commit sins, greet them, treat them as believers. Do not deem that they are non-believers. And most importantly, give them hope in Allah's mercy. This is the best thing that you can tell a sinner. The worst thing that you can tell a sinner is that you're doomed. You're going to go to Jahannam. When a sinner comes to you, Allah is telling the Prophet, essentially, your responsibility is to instill hope in them that they can still renew their relationship with Allah. But how do you renew this relationship? <inaudible> if you commit any wrongdoing out of ignorance, you should repent. <inaudible> you don't only repent. You need to do good deeds. When you were sinning, you were destroying. You were engaged in destruction, right? When you do good, when the Quran says, Wa aslaha, in order to rebuild, you have to do good deeds because do, good deeds represents construction. Destruction is sin. When you do tawbah and you don't have any amal salih, You've only stopped the destruction. To rebuild, you need amal salih. And good deeds, as the Quran says, washes away the evil deeds. When you do that, when you sin, repent, and do good, this is when you will find Allah to be ghafoor. Allah is not only ghafoor. Ghafoor is often forgiving exceedingly forgiving rahim is the one who is exceedingly merciful there's a hadith from amir al-mu'mineen salawatullahi alayhi where he says at-tawbatu ala arba'ati da'a'in amir al-mu'mineen he says he actually, he actually illustrates he tries to portray tawbah as a structure he says, Toba stands on four pillars. So if you think of Toba as a building, Toba is supported by four different pillars. Amir al muminin he says, Nadabun bil qalb. Having remorse with the heart is number one. Wastighfarun bil lisan. Forgiveness with the tongue. The first is remorse with the heart. The second is forgiveness with the tongue. Number three is وَعَمَلٌ بِالْجَوَارِحِ An action with the limbs. Because you need to rebuild. You need this construction phase. And number four is وَعَزْمٌ أَلَّا يَعُودٌ You make a determination. You are resolute in not returning to that phase of destruction, that act of sin. And then Allah, in the next ayah, will conclude here, وَكَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ وَلِتَسْتَبِينَ سَبِيلُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ And thus do we expound the verses, that the way of the guilty be made clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here very beautifully He's saying that I put forward a variety of arguments and indications to refute falsehood. You see the Quran, Allah doesn't only expound to establish truth. He doesn't give us various stories and advices and admonishments to establish truth. But Allah says, this Quran, I expound and I give you a variety of verses to establish truth in some cases, but also to do what? To refute 
falsehood because the truth will only become clear when you expose falsehood and you shed light on the truth we ask allah azza wa jal to bless us and guide us allahumma ghfir lil mu'minin wal mu'minat al muslimin wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khairat innaka mujib al da'awat innaka qadi al hajat انك على كل شيء قدير واخر دعوانا ان الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد واله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد we have some time for q and a if anyone has any questions or comments thank you sheikh um, i have a couple of questions um, um, in ayah 50, um, you explained how the mushrikeen would ask uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, um, the question about uh, when the day of judgment is going to happen. Yes. Um, in a different context, you um, also give an, give an example where uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam is asking the Prophet about what is the best thing uh, he can do at, in this night. Yeah. But that, I mean, if you put these two uh, questions or these type of questions uh, in a comparison, it, it definitely shows the quality of, um, of these uh, questions um, that, that is really in a contrast. Uh, one thing being something that is not really important to know when the Day of Judgment is going to happen, but the other thing, Imam Ali alayhi salam is trying to find something that is, is going to help him in the Day, day of Judgment. So, so now my question is, um, so I feel like um, um, in our lives, we are also sometimes very distracted with things that are questions that are not very important. Um, and and we that keeps us really busy and away from the important questions. Um, so, so just to give you an example, there are people that are asking uh, when the, the appearance of, of, of the Imam is going to happen. And other people are asking, how can we be prepared for the, you know, for the uh, appearance of the imam? Sure. So, so, um, so can you can you please comment on this on this problem? Is that something maybe that, that shaitan is using as a tool for us to to keep us away from the important uh, from the from the truth? Um, and and how can we gain the knowledge of um, that we are in a position where we can identify the priority and and the importance of these uh, things? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's definitely interesting when you when you when you juxtapose Imam Amir al muminins question about you know preparing yourself for the day of judgment and the the questions that the the mushrikeen posed to the Holy Prophet. You know, definitely, you know, when you're asking a question, Shaytan has many tactics. In fact, one of the most effective tactic of Shaytan is to make us waste our time. Because, you know, time is a depreciating commodity. Now, whether it's a question or a comment, we should always look at, at our time as a depreciating commodity. Meaning that, and I agree with you, I mean, when, when people ask me, you know, Sheikh, can you give us a list of the signs of the reappearance of the Imam? Now, it really depends on, you know, why this question is being asked. You know, sometimes it's intellectual curiosity, but I definitely believe that, you know, we should definitely ask about things that are practical. We should ask about things that are relevant because our time is very limited. You know, the time that we have to study and to sit with scholars is limited. Amir al-Mu'minin used to get very frustrated with companions who used to ask him fruitless questions. So definitely, I mean, whenever you ask a question, you should always ask yourself, is this knowledge going to have any practical application in my life? If the answer is no, then it's best to move on and focus on questions that are more pressing. You know, this is why when, when people ask me about jinn, I'm not really interested in having an in-depth conversation about the nature of jinn and all of the ahadith that describe jinn why because most of the time the people who are asking about jinn they don't even know how to interact with human beings they don't know the adab of dealing with human beings you want to go study about jinn 
So I agree. I think that before asking a question, before, and I'm not trying to, you know, discourage anyone from asking a question. By all means, if, if you want to ask, there's no harm in it. But if it's if it's becoming a habit, there, there's no harm in asking a question every once in a while out of intellectual curiosity. But if it's becoming a pattern where the overwhelming majority of your questions have no practical application, that's when it becomes a problem because you're wasting a great chunk of your time on knowledge where we say this is this is information that does not benefit you if you know it and it will not harm you if you're ignorant of it um you talked about intercession and that's something that i've been wanting to talk to um an ulama or some a scholar about so a lot of shia people will almost um almost go to the point where they're almost like trying to make an imam or someone uh say happy and i i don't know if that's if that's okay so for example um there's uh you do nazar and you do the niyaz and people eat from that and you do that on every thursday every time you have to ask for something like um i hope my kid passes the exam and you do like you ask the imam is that okay or should we ask Allah? Because my Sunni friends, they think that that's a, that's a very big no-no for them. And a lot of Shia people, for us, it's like, yeah, that's something we do. Now, we have to make a distinction here. Because when someone calls upon anyone other than Allah, so say, for example, someone goes to Karbala, and they ask the Imam السلام, to fulfill their needs. If you're asking the Imam and you're asking the Imam thinking that the Imam has independent power, meaning that he's independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has the ability to grant you your hajat independent of Allah, then this is shirk. But if you're asking the Imam to grant you your hajat, knowing that the Imam السلام, is one of the greatest servants of Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed him with certain capabilities. In the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made, for example, the rain subservient to the angel that is in charge of riz. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given certain abilities to these chosen servants. So if you're asking them, knowing that they are dependent on Allah, that their ability to respond to me is a God-given ability, then there's no problem. Now, which is better? You know, let me give you an example. You know, because some people say that, oh, it's better for me to address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. The answer is, imagine, imagine you own a business and you have made a declaration that your son for example, is very dear to you. And if any of you have a request, you can come to me or you can come to my son. You have that option. Now, you know that the owner loves his son and it pleases him that other people respect his son. By going through the son, you're actually showing respect to the owner, right? Because you're honoring the position of that son that you have that you've given these responsibilities to. So similarly, similarly, when we go through the Ahlul Bayt, it's not that we believe that going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fruitless or fruit or, uh, or futile, but rather we're honoring these great servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom Allah has asked us to honor. You know, when we don't have a good record with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of our sins, it makes more sense that we seek his favor through his most beloved servants. You know, in the same way, and this is something that probably the children can relate to. You know, if you want to convince your your parents to take you to a theme park, but you know, for the past month you haven't been on your best behavior, right? What are you gonna do? You don't have you know the audacity to ask them yourself so what do you do 
you reach out to someone who is highly respected by your parents. Because through them, your parents are more likely to grant you your request. So you go through them. Similarly, in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we sin, we transgress. We want to make Ahlul Bayt our partners when we address Allah. So when we say someone goes to Imam Hussein alayhi salam, when you take the Imam as your Shafi'i, it's not that you're making him a partner with Allah. You're actually making the Ma'soom your partner. Because individually, you're not very impressive in Allah's eyes. But when you connect yourself to the Ma'soom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more likely to respond to you favorably. So going back to your question, it depends. If you're asking the Imam to grant you your request, and you have this idea that the Imam has power independent of Allah, this is forbidden. But if you're asking him for help, knowing that they are fully dependent upon Allah and Allah has bestowed upon them certain abilities, there's no problem. In the same way that you ask for human beings in your everyday life for assistance, why don't you ask the Imam for assistance? If you say, oh, but the Imam is dead, Allah in the Quran tells us that the martyrs are alive, but you don't perceive it. If the martyrs are alive, all of the Ahlul Bayt were martyrs. And they're, they're the Imams of martyrs. So in the same way that you can be helped by a living person, an average living person, and there's no haram in asking a living person for assistance. If I, if I ask my wife, for example, for help, and I and I believe that she has power independent of God, this is shirk, this is haram. So as long as you're making this request, being fully cognizant of the fact that this individual is an imam, he's ma'asum, but he's still faqir in relation to Allah. He's still dependent, there's no sin, and in fact, this is commendable. Because Allah in the Quran says, وَابْتَغُوا إِلَيْهِ الْوَسِيلَةِ And seek the means to approaching him. And the Ahlul Bayt, السلام, according to some interpretations, they are the wasila between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. Sheikh, uh, one of the things you said was uh, that the, um, the, the one of the intercessions is like being having the imama or im imana. Imana. Uh, imana, yeah. So uh, could you just elaborate on that a little bit? I didn't quite understand what you were referring to. So... Again, the, the hadith doesn't really go into detail as to what is the meaning of amana, but from my humble understanding is if you are a person who honors trusts that are placed at your disposal, that trustworthiness, the fact that you are amin, that will serve as a type of intercession for you. Because in, in some ways, all of your good deeds are... They intercede for you. But there are some actions that have prominence. And an amana represents this idea of respecting haqqun nas, honoring the trust that have been placed at your disposal. But, so by doing that, this will give you a type of protection, a, a type of shafa'a on that day. And again, and Allah knows best. If, there, if there's anyone that, that has any uh, other possible uh, interpretation, you can share that. Thank you. Um, Sheikh, my, um, my other question is uh, also about the same topic. Um, so I have a lot of problems with uh, understanding Shafa uh, and what that actually means. Yeah. And um, I, I'm looking at this as something that is not, not from my understanding, it's not something fair. Mm. Uh, because at the, at, you know, at, the day, uh, at the day of the judgment, uh, um, what counts is um, our actions. Um, so, so now I, I'm struggling with understanding how, um, for example, the example that you gave, the, um, how a relative can help me on the Day of Judgment if I have done wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is not, this is opposed to Allah's ad. Mm -hmm. um, so so how, can, how can we explain that? I have also, heard, I have also um, um, seen other explanations, like uh, I think it's uh, um, Ayatollah Mutahari, one of his books, where he talks about shafa as something that is um, 
help, um, a type of help that is provided to us in this life so that we can correct our actions here and not something for, for the day of judgment. Mm. Now, when, when you say that this, you know, this idea of intercession contradicts Allah's adl, on the day of judgment, we don't want Allah to be just with us. We don't, we don't want Allah to be adil with us. We want Allah to be merciful with us. So I would agree with you. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to be 100% just on that day, then yes, perhaps the argument could stand. But again, Allah, Allah in the ayah that I mentioned today, كَتَبَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Allah has prescribed mercy upon himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not trying to be strictly just on that day. He's just with also a bit of mercy. So these are all different manifestations of Allah's mercy. So instead of looking at this as being unfair, rather look at this as Allah is trying to find excuses to take us out of Jahannam and take us to Jannah. And there is a minimum required, required requirement. Of course, there are certain things that have to be done for you to be qualified for shafa. You know, it's so if you know there are certain deeds that could potentially disqualify someone from earning this shafa. So shafa is not something that's it's not like a blank check that is offered on the day of judgment. Let me share with you a hadith about uh, who is deprived of shafa. A on that day so the holy prophet وآله, he says two types of people will not be included in my intercession two groups the tyrannical an oppressive ruler and his aides and the heretical extremists in matters of religion this is one hadith and there's another hadith where the holy prophet he says my intercession is intended for those who have committed grave sins from among my community except for those guilty of polytheism and injustice to others in another hadith the holy prophet says my intercession on behalf of one who does not believe in my intercession will not be accepted by allah so if someone doesn't believe in shafa'a ah, they will be deprived of shafa'a ah, meaning on the day of judgment they will have to rely on only their own good deeds they won't have that extra support someone who who takes their prayers lightly you know, some, sometimes they pray, sometimes they don't. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, when he was on his deathbed, he says, لا تنال شفاعتنا مستخفا بصلاته Our intercession will not reach the one who takes his prayers lightly. So there's a certain level of faith and good deeds that has to be met for you to qualify for this shafa'a. Otherwise, you're going to have to, you're just going to have to depend on and rely on your own good deeds. You won't have that extra mercy shown to you on that day. So going back to your question, we, we're, we're hoping that Allah is not just with us on the day of judgment. We don't want Allah's, Allah to be adil with us on the day of judgment. We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be forgiving, to be merciful. Because if Allah is just with us, no, no who's going to enter Jannah? No one will enter paradise if Allah is strictly just and he's not merciful even the holy prophet says i enter paradise because of divine mercy not because of divine justice Sheikh, in i 51 you mentioned um those who believe in resurrection but do not prepare for it yeah and i was wondering what are some things that we can do to prepare for it to prepare for resurrection the day of resurrection there are Sister Sumaya, this is a lecture in and of itself. But very briefly, to prepare for the Day of Judgment, in a nutshell, 
the best way to prepare for the Day of Judgment is to fulfill the wajibat and avoid the muharramat. And, you've, and if you've committed sins, hasten to repentance. Do not delay repentance. Be good to your parents. Honor your parents because your parents are a reflection of divine pleasure and divine wrath. Avoid, avoid oppressing people. If you've wronged anyone, seek their forgiveness and their pardon. Give charity, Salatul Layl. There are many, many benefits to Salatul Layl. One of the benefits of Salatul Layl is that you're protected from the, the frightening, from the horrors of the Day of Judgment, from the punishment in the grave. So many of these good deeds, you know, uh, are considered, you know, ways to prepare for the Day of Judgment. Maintaining ties with your family members, fasting, doing mustahabbat but really if you want to boil it down to the most simple uh, formula is to fulfill your wajibat and avoid the muharramat because this is essentially what Allah you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you if you if you're avoiding sin and you're fulfilling your wajibat this is enough to admit you into paradise Allah would rather have you do the bare minimum and avoid haram rather than do mustahabbat and all of these nawafil while you're still committing sins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you so much. May Allah bless you all. And uh, next week, same time? Inshallah, yes. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum.